Good evening, my name is Dexter Bishop and I'm the president of the General Lander Post 5 uh, CWRT, which is the Civil War Roundtable here at this facility. Anyway, as we always do, uh, let's begin by uh, all rising and we'll join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. I just want to give you a couple of uh, high points of the evening. Uh, first being our speaker. I received a, uh, an email this afternoon, and uh, unfortunately, he's had a, a problem at his home and will not be able to be with us this evening. That being the case, we will try to uh, r r have an open uh, event in which everybody can have a chance to say, say something if they wish. Uh, one of the questions that I would be asking, and anyone can uh, certainly jump in on this, and I would like to know from all of you, who's your favorite Civil War character? <clears throat> now, I, I, I see the hands going up already. Uh, the, the thing is, we have to limit you in time because we are being uh, uh, watched by the big camera in the sky over here. And so uh, the thing is, you can only, yeah, that's it, Clear. get your hair ready. Uh, oh, I still have some. Yeah, why, yeah. I'm getting mine back. Uh, anyway, the, the whole point that I'm trying to say is, you'll have an opportunity tonight to put your two cents in on who you think was, or who is your uh, most favorite type in the way of being a can. Not yet, okay? okay. Just wait. Uh, we have a few things to do yet. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you at the appropriate time. Okay, uh, <clears throat> before we get started, we always ask, do we have anybody that has anything they would like to comment about or to announce? Do we have any announcements? Yes? I'll just give one. Um, I went to see the movie, which is called, where did he go? Mm -hmm. What's the name of the movie? They shall, shall not grow old. Since we're in the World War One room, it's yeah. amazing, absolutely amazing, and I totally recommend it to anybody to see it. Okay, very good. Uh, <clears throat> I have my usual announcement. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that is on the twenty fifth, we will be having the rededication of this building and its contents. It will start at six thirty. Uh, and part of the program, time has shifted a little bit uh, from 6 to 6.30, uh, and that gives everybody a little more time to get here. And what we're going to be doing is what it's called the vacant chair. And this is something that is uh, very impressive. If you've never seen it, you want to be here that night. Uh, the members of Camp F five here and the, some of the uh, SVRs, uh, members of the SUVCWs, uh, will be here to uh, pull and perform the vacant chair. It is quite a uh, ceremony. So we'll be doing that on the 25th. Following that, there'll be a collation which is sponsored by the friends of the General uh, Lander uh, Museum, Grand Army of the Republic Museum of Lynn, Inc. Uh, and so I would just like to say uh, for everyone, uh, be sure to uh, set that side up, night aside. It's going to be a, a very, very impressive evening. The guys will be here in uniform, uh, and we will have some dignitaries. It should be a very, very good night. So I would hope you would all make every effort to be here on that day. It's only a couple of weeks away, too. Time is flying. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, Al, do you have anything you want to report on or, or say? Uh, 
five days of May trip that uh, the Greater Boston Roundtable sponsors is coming along very nicely. Uh, there are still some uh, vacancies for rooms and on the bus. So if any of you are considering having a going away for five days with us and visit uh, all the sites involved during the Civil War and Revolutionary War yeah. in uh, Washington, D.C., we have an opportunity to view the uh, Constitution, Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Great Bill of Rights, hopefully the Emancipation Proclamation if it's being displayed. Uh, we're going to have a commemoration ceremony at the grave of uh, General uh, Logan. General Logan at the Soldiers and Sailors uh, Cemetery in Washington at the summer home of Abraham Lincoln. They get to view the Pentagon for a nice tour that uh, Dexter is so very nicely arranged for. So it's going to be a wonderful little trip for us. Uh, we're going to get to see an awful lot of that. So if you're thinking of going, just come and let me know. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, can, I can say from my perspective, the tours that uh, Al runs are very nice. And if you haven't taken one, you really should. You'll find that uh, the, he feeds you well. And uh, the only problem I've ever had with him is he doesn't give you a chance to rest. <laughs> You're going all the time. So anyway, that's the story. Now, uh, mm -hmm. I think that covers all that I would want to deal with tonight. On, if by the way, if you haven't paid your dues, they're fifteen dollars a piece. Al is the treasurer, and he'll be happy to take your money tonight before you leave. Now, as I said earlier, because of our speaker not being able to be with us due to a problem at home, uh, I thought what we would try to do, like we've done in the past when this has happened, and that is answer that one question that we throw out and see, how, see what we get back, and have a chance to talk about it and to maybe discuss it. Uh, but we're all gentlemen here, so we don't have, and ladies, by the way, but uh, we don't get too uh, rambunctious. Uh, otherwise, I have to, We're all civilized. Otherwise, we have to do this. We come over here, and we get this hammer, and whack. And that means you got to stop talking. So anyway, one of the things is that you have to do is when you're going to speak, you have to come up here because the microphone to pick you up is here. And so that kind of is limiting uh, what we can do. So anyway, uh, the first thing I would like to just talk about, when I said what's my, a particular member of and he happens to be a member of this post, uh, followed by the name of John J. Uh, John G. B. Adams. Now, uh, Adams is quite a character. His, his life was cut short in the fact that he died of a heart attack while at his desk at the State House, uh, and so it, and it was in 1900, I believe, was the date on him. And gee, you, you have all that information. Maybe I'll have you come up and talk on this one. But uh, anyway, the thing that I like about this guy is he was very humble. He didn't uh, try to be the man that he was. It's quite interesting. Here's a guy who's the recipient of the Medal of Honor. He uh, was instrumental in founding the Chelsea Soldiers' Home. Uh, he was its second, back then they, I, they were called commandants. Uh, he was the second commandant, first one uh, having to resign because of ill health, and brought that home along quite a bit. He was also very politically savvy, which is quite interesting, in the fact that he was able to take and get that home supported by the politicians in this state in a time when chances of them putting up any money was pretty slim. But it took the full weight of the Massachusetts delegation 
of the Grand Army of the Republic leadership to, to get what they got in order to be able to build. Or actually, they bought an old hotel and opened it up for men who were living in almshouses because when they came back, Either their jobs had disappeared or because of physical problems, they were not able to work. And they ended up in almshouses. And that being the case, keeping with the fact that they took care of their own, and that was their, one of their biggest slogans, the Grand Army boys took care of the Grand Army people who had problems. This post was one in which of all the money they raised, and I'll give you, as an example, in 1890, they had $90,000 in assets, and they spent all of it on their people. None of it went into anybody's pocket. Their sons, and I've told this story many times, their sons went and got a, uh, a, a, I won't say a loan, a, a, uh, due to a fire here in Lynn, the city was giving out grants. So the sons went up to City Hall and got some grant money to give to the veterans that were affected by the fire. And the individuals who were here, the fathers of these sons, now, in today's world, we would call them real sons. I'm a son of Union veterans of the Civil War, but I'm not a real son because if I had a, a, someone, he would be de long dead. And so I would just be a son, period. But this is a real son. In fact, we just had in, in our organization, I think it was the last real son pass this past year. So anyway, they got this money and they came in and they said, uh, look, Dad, look what I got. We got you th these thousands of dollars that we can give to those members who need assistance. And dads, the dad looked at them and said, sorry, son. But we take care of our own, take the money back. So they had to take all the money back to City Hall. They got it back to City Hall. They came back to tell their dads, their real dads, we took the money back. It's all set. Don't worry. And then the real dad said, OK, since you did that, this is your punishment. You can't meet here anymore. And they were asked to leave and never came back. Well, they did come back, because three years later, they were back in the hall. But that's the st strength that these guys had. They took care of their own. This guy here, he was leading the charge for that, for taking care of your own. Now, if you came down here, and, and perhaps you were a direct descendant of this guy, you could come down and say, oh, that's my great-great-grandfather. Guess what? The great-great-grandfather, we never saw a picture of him. Well, there he is. So when they go home, they go home with his picture, a copy of his picture, all of this information, which was researched out of the uh, public library and what have you, of the, from the newspaper articles about him. And as you can see, he was written a lot, a lot. This is pretty thick. Some of them are thin, but this one is pretty thick. And in fact, on this front page of this one here, it's all about the issue of the Chelsea Soldiers Home. And I'm going to leave this up here so that after we get done tonight, if you want to look at it, it'll be over on the table. And you can have a chance to do it that way. Uh, he was a first in many items during the war itself. First to do a, 
amphibious landing coming into a battle at Fredericksburg. First, to be in house-to-house -house fighting, same battle. And this is the particular battle at Maurice Heights when his regiment was ordered up this big open field to charge. Up at the top of the hill, there was a sunken road. And in that road was whole lines of Confederate soldiers. And so they had a turkey shoot. No problem at all. You come out into the open field and start up, you're going to get shot. One of the things that you, you have to realize in, in this whole thing is during the Civil War, they didn't have your walkie-talkies and your telephones and all of these ways of communicating that we have today. You had to listen for a drumbeat. You had to listen for a, a bugle call. Well, you had to follow wherever the flag went, you went. There were eight people carrying the, the flag. Oh, actually, there was, I think, two or three different. They had three, three flags. But they all got shot because that was uh, the Confederates, just as the Yankees did. Whoever had the flag, they were the first ones everybody shot at. Because if the flag went down, that stopped the regiment from going forward. There was no forward motion at all. As a result, as a result of that, the mess that he got into was he's trying to follow the flag, but it kept going down because the guys in front of him were kept getting shot. He finally runs up, grabs all the flags, and runs to the left or the right. I don't know which way, but he went out of the middle of the field. And the regiment followed him because they follow the flag. By doing that, he probably saved two thirds of the regiment. Because if they'd have stayed out where they were, the uh, Confederate uh, troops were just having a, a great time. There was no stop in the shooting. They're standing up in, in a sunken road. If you've never been down there, you should go and see what it's like. But they're standing, shooting down. These guys are trying to come up. And all they're seeing to shoot at is maybe their heads from here up. Or, the, or sometimes the gun's coming over the top. And they had people feeding them so that there was a constant barrage that took them out. And this guy did what instinct told him to do. And he saved that two-thirds of that regiment. So when I think of this guy, I think, wow, there is, there's a real hero of the Civil War. Although when he came back here, all he wanted to be, because they were offering him all kinds of accolades and, and uh, calling him a colonel, and I don't know what else they were t thinking of giving him. And all he said is, all I want to be is called Captain Jack. And that was his story. Just let me be Captain Jack. And Captain Jack was one man who had a tremendous, tremendous impact on this city. He lived up on Grosvenor. I think it's Grosvenor Street, off of Ocean Street, going down to the beach. One of the, just as, as a quick aside, one of the trustees for this hall accidentally bought, not knowing it, bought his house and found in the attic a pile of his papers. Because one of the other things that he did was write on behalf of any veteran that he knew had needed help or needed a pension, he would write on their behalf that, yes, that person served. Yes, he is in need of a pension and deserves a pension. So that's the type of guy he was. His brothers came first. So anyway, that's my little story about Adams.
And I'll put this over there, and if anybody wants to look at all the, all the things that are written about them, it's here. Okay? Uh, Bob, I'm going to ask you, uh, uh, who's your favorite? <laughs> you got to come up. That gives you time to think. Yes. Well, everybody that has heard me speak before knows that once I get going, I can talk. Um, but before I talk, I rehearse my speeches um, many times so because I want you to feel like you've gotten your money's worth, um, so to speak. Um, th that's the most difficult question of all for me, um, who's my favorite, um, because I, I, I really don't have a favorite. Um, maybe the, com the common soldier, Sam Watkins of um, the te Army of the Tennessee, who um, fought for the Confederates, his, um, his uh, memoirs comes to mind. Um, I just love learning about all of them. Um, and I love learning about everybody. Um, if I can be cliche-ish, um, I would say, of course, Abraham Lincoln is m my favorite character out of the Civil War um, because he defined the Civil War better than anybody. Um, there's so many sayings that I could tell you that he said, but one that particularly comes to mind is him saying that the issues of this war illustrate in the biggest way um, the difference between right and wrong since the beginning of time. Um, a battle, it's a battle of ideals between two antagonistic systems where one system says, I work and get to keep the fruits of my labor, while the other system says, you work and I get to keep the fruits of your labor. So with that in mind, um, we were supposed to hear a wonderful, wonderful professor. And some of my heroes are here tonight. Al, I got to tell you, you've done a remarkable job of getting great speakers for us over the years. And, and I think that the speaker series is the, hot, the, the, the um, bread and butter of this organization. At least it is for me. And I, I just appreciate the hard work that you do um, um, very, very much. So Al's one of my heroes. <laughs> um, and we appreciate it very, very much. Um, we were supposed to have a professor named Kevin Levin here tonight. He's fantastic. If I recall correctly, he's spoken here twice in the past. Um, he wrote a book about the, um, the crater in Petersburg, which, which I, um, I, um, I read, and it's a terrific book. But his lectures are fantastic. And he, he, he's tackling things like um, the Confederate flag, um, the issue of slavery. And so I thought that um, in the newsletter it, uh, that came out a few weeks ago, it was he was going to talk about black soldiers fighting for the Confederacy, that issue. And um, he, he, um, he would have done a remarkable job. And when he does come here, I'm sure he will um, you know, tell us more about that. But as I was driving here, I was going to talk to him a little bit and ask him if he ever heard of a particular person that I'll tell you about in a minute. So this is a fascinating person that every um, history professor from um, James McPherson, Pulitzer Prize winner, um, historian, to uh, Bruce Catton, they all refer to him in the notes of their books. Um, to get to that person, 
I'm going to mention five, five men. The secretaries of war for the Confederacy um, was Leroy Walker, um, James Seddon, Judah Benjamin, George Washington Randolph, who, by the way, was the grandson of Thomas Jefferson, and the fifth and last Confederate Secretary of War was John C. Breckinridge, who was an ex-Vice President of the United States um, under um, James Buchanan. So right before Lincoln became the president, he was the vice president. He was also a Confederate general. Um, so all the five secretaries of war had one thing in common, and that was they all had the same secretary. That secretary was a man named John Beauchamp Jones, who's the guy I'm going to tell you a little bit about. He came from Philadelphia, and, and when South Carolina um, um, seceded, um, he left Philadelphia. Because he was actually almost got tied and feathered because he had a newspaper. He worked for a newspaper that was very pro-Southern, and um, at the outbreak of war, um, um, the citizens of Philadelphia ran him out of town. He was also famous for being a, um, a dime store uh, novelist. He'd write westerns. And, but anyways, um, he went to the Confederate White House and volunteered to Jefferson Davis. Uh, Davis had read his articles and, and knew of him because he was a famous writer in the country at the time. And he, he offered his service. He said, how can I serve? Um, the Confederacy, and Davis said, well, um, we need a secretary. So he became the secretary of the Secretaries of War, and he, um, he wrote a diary. It's called a War Clerk's Diary. Um, I read it about 20 years ago, and I was just blown away. Um, I have hundreds of books on the Civil War at my home, but there's a, a shelf for special things if I want to, you know, um, re-remind re myself of reality. So it's an original source. Um, anyways, in this diary, um, he, and I think Kevin Levin might have, might have talked about it. We'll find out when he comes to see if I have this right. But um, Kevin was going to talk about um, uh, blacks who fought for the Confederacy. Um, which really uh, is a ridiculous um, thing if you think about it. Uh, it didn't happen the way some writers of fake history write that uh, blacks were dying to sign up and they were charging and fighting um, for um, uh, um, the Confederacy. Um, John Beauchamp Jones was in Richmond at the end of the war um, when Grant was coming in and Lee was um, leaving, going towards which would eventually be um, Appomattox. And he describes black soldiers in Richmond being round up. They were, they were, uh, they were the old, they were the infirmed, they were cripples. And, and um, they were given Confederate uniforms and they were lined up in two companies. There were only two companies of black Confederate soldiers, um, and each company had about 50 soldiers. Normally, you'd have up to 100 soldiers. Uh, John Beauchamp Jones um, was looking out his window, looking at these wretched creatures, these poor people uh, forced to, to put on these uniforms, and he said in his diary um, that it was the most pathetic and sad sight that he had ever seen. And he said it was the first time he had ever seen um, Confederate soldiers being held in position at the point of a gun by other Confederate soldiers. 
So these were white Confederate soldiers that were holding uh, bayonets. And he said the townspeople, many of them came out and were shouting curses at them, um, rolling up um, balls of mud and throwing at them. One guy even threw a brick. And um, so anyways, when they left Richmond and um, um, when, when, when Grant was chasing them, as we say, they were try they, these two companies of soldiers were trying to catch up with, um, with um, Grant, um, catch up with Lee, but they escaped as soon as they could. And when Abraham Lincoln came into Richmond, these were some of the soldiers that were praising him as their savior. And uh, Lincoln, of course, was saying, oh, no, I'm not your savior. You know, get up and, um, you know, thank God for your freedom, not me. But um, it's, it, 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 it's a hard reality, but it's a truth. And, and I always try to tell you the truth, um, no, no matter <laughs> where, where it takes me. But um, anyways, um, John Beauchamp Jones is a, is a person that uh, I just find fascinating and you can you can look it up his diary a war clerk's diary i think it's a confederate war clerk's diary but every day he wrote down what happened in the confederate white house what congressmen were coming in lee coming in and talking to him and just just a fascinating guy and i'm i'm sorry that i didn't have a, a favorite that's yeah. okay but, okay okay yeah you're you're forgiven but <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. I got two hands over here. Go ahead. I just want to make a comment that the diary um, is on Google eBooks for free. Oh, is that right? eBooks for free. You can make a link available to the newsletter. Yeah. And your most favorite or? My most favorite. Okay has a very uh, personal connection to Wendy and I. Um, I hope you will bear with me because I'm going to read a short paragraph. Well, it's not a short paragraph, but it's a paragraph. I'm quoting from an 1816, sorry, 1916 Encyclopedia of Massachusetts Biography, apparently. is I, I don't have the full title, but um, after I read this, paragraph, then I will skip over and summarize the rest of it. But um, I think you will find this as, uh, as moving as Wendy and I do. The hardships and suffering a man can endure and then recuperate and live to an age greater than the scriptural allotment of his years is illustrated in the life of Mr. Martin, now in his 75th year. He was captured with 1,600 of his brigade at Petersburg, June 22nd, 1864, and for nine months was a prisoner suffering all the horrors of Andersonville and other southern stockade prisons, was starved, abused, poisoned by filthy food and water, finally paroled in an emaciated condition in rags, sore, bruised, and sick, yet he recovered and was able to engage in business and until his retirement in 1909 was one of Lynn's successful caterers to the public taste. That he lived through that terrible ordeal of Southern prison life was a miracle. That he is hale and hearty in comparison with many others of his age is no less remarkable. His mother lived to be 94 years of age, his paternal grandmother to the age of 95, and Mr. Martin bids fair to be as wonderful an example as lo of, of longevity. Mr. Martin was born in 1841 in Lynn. He enlisted in 1862, Company M of the 1st Regiment Massachusetts Heavy Artillery. I won't name all the battles, but we have great documentation. Again, captured one of the places where he was in, um, imprisoned was Andersonville for nine months. When he was paroled, 1865, um, 
His friends from the north sent him a $10 bill. And again, just quoting briefly, Mr. Martin felt so elated that the first thing he purchased was a can of sardines. <laughs> he made his way back to Lynn and was admitted into a partnership with a restaurateur named Mr. John Earl. The two of them began to build a very successful restaurant business, even though the Great Lynn Fire of 1889, the first Great Lynn Fire, completely destroyed their building. Um, there's actually a photo of the Earl restaurant in the, um, the Lynn Museum sponsored Diane Shepard book on Lynn showing a hastily constructed restaurant um, roughly where the item building is now that was, I have a newspaper clipping referring to it as sort of like a Wild West saloon, but his regular patrons stayed with him and they, um, that Mr. Martin and Mr. Earl constructed a brand new four-story building, sort of L-shaped, if you're familiar with where the farmer's market is, right next to Lynn Arts, next to the bank block, just up from the Lynn Museum, diagonally across from the diner. That's where their new restaurant was built in 1891 after the fire. Mr. Martin retired in 1909 and, of course, was a member of the Grand Army of the Republic post five. His photograph is upstairs on the wall. Mr. Martin um, was, I think, from my record, from, from my, my investigations, a smart cookie because he retired in 1909, which was right around the time that the plans to elevate the railroad through Central Square were being made. It turns out that when the railroad was elevated and the structure built that we still have today in Central Square, they took the building that was the Earl and Martin restaurant. There was another building constructed in that spot. Um, it wasn't the vacant lot that it is now for all the period of time since 1915 when they elevated the railroad, but the original Earl and Martin restaurant apparently had to succumb to the railroad construction. Um, now, why do we think that Mr. Martin went into the restaurant business? We think it's because he was at Andersonville and he learned the value of clean, healthy, solid food. We have no direct evidence, but I'm still working on that. And finally, why does Mr. Martin mean so much to Wendy and I? In 1905, just four years before he retired, he built the house in which we now live on Rockaway Street. So thank you, Mr. Martin. His photograph upstairs, if next time we're all upstairs together, I can point him out to you. We thank Mr. Martin for our house on a regular basis. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Next on the, uh, Bob, uh, Bob, yeah. Larry, would, would you like to uh, share a few words with us? Larry? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, these. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a couple of things to show you guys if, if you haven't been through the museum. Uh, okay. This was a last minute thing. So. Right here. Okay. It's a little heavy. <laughs> yeah. But uh, some of the things in the museum, a lot of people haven't even seen them. This is on a bottom shelf of one of our one of our displays upstairs. And as everyone knows, the rifle was probably one of the most infamous, the things that caused most of the casualties in the war were the rifle and the Manet ball. Well, on the, uh, these, I believe, and someone correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but these, these are rifle shells for cannons. They also did the same thing for cannons. So when these things actually started going through the air, instead of going up in the air like the round shells, they, the velocity was incredibly in increased. These made every mortar and brick fort obsolete the first time they were occupied. You know, so these these two are from Gettysburg. Wow. Oh my God! And uh, this is the stuff the guys brought back to them. You know, <laughs> and uh, so it's incredible. And John, can I see the other one? You guys 
you remember at the beginning of the wall, the wall was all glory and everything like that. And if you remember a lot of the pictures, yep. the guys would be carrying things like this. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd have them in their belts, they'd have eight guns on them, with knives, and <clears throat> everything was real cool. And then after the first year of the war, you didn't see it anymore. <laughs> it wasn't the glorious thing that it was before. So these are the things that the guys decided to bring back. They're kind of heavy to carry, too. But the other thing that I wanted to show you was that book right there. And it's, and it's, uh, it's a book of, what, of, of every member in 1890 that was alive. And they had each member sit down and say, who were your friends in the war? And what are the th what's the things you remember the most about the war? And I picked out a few that I love to read. And they picked out the guy with the best handwriting. If you guys look at it, the handwriting is beautiful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of them is uh, Mr. Larrabee I picked out real quick. And, and his name was Emery Larrabee. And he ended up being a cop in Lynn after the war. But up to Lynn, I have I have the, the the copy of the Lynn item in there, and he was he was uh, at Ford's Theater the night Lincoln was shot, and he has he has his, his tickets the third row in the orchestra, you know, and I, I'd like to say that it's not the truth, but it's on the whole front page of the item, <laughs> you know, and uh, and what do you say about that? And he said that he chased uh, Booth also, you know, and but but he got across the bridge before he got a chance to, but he saw Booth when they brought him back. Three or four, four days later, and uh, they saw his, he saw his body. But he ended up being a Lynn cop for 18 years afterwards, you know. And the other guy, Mr. Corson, who saw McKinley shot in Buffalo in 1901, he was standing very close to him. Think of that. We, you know, we get this one building here, and two of the guys saw four of our presidents that were assassinated. Two of the guys here seen him. You know, it was a smaller world, true. You know, but. Uh, but to me, that's tremendous to think about, you know? Then when you read about another guy in here named John Westcott, he's one of my favorites because during one of the early battles, he was captured and he ended up spending time in Libby Prison and some other prison. He finally uh, was exchanged and he, was, he was, went back to his unit and he was captured again, you know? So now he's gotta go back to prison again. And he hated that, he escaped and they caught him th a third time and brought him back. And this time a Confederate soldier that brought him back let him go. And because he just felt sorry for him. I think the guy's like a loser, <laughs> you know, and uh, so he ended up letting him go. And they, 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 they got some Confederate uniforms, him and his pal from Lynn named Fisk. They both got Confederate uniforms, and they actually m marched north to go towards the Union forces, hoping to escape. And they marched with a Confederate unit in Confederate uniforms with guns, and they drew rations. And they actually sat around and, and sh shot the breeze with them and everything like that. <laughs> then they bolted and, yeah. uh, and they got out. And by the time they got out though, their unit was a nine month unit. And two weeks earlier, they had been, his, his, their unit had left. And so they had nowhere to go. So the people uh, gave them train fare and they, they went back to Lynn, but they were so racked with, with, with diarrhea and every other thing from escaping through the swamps and everything that one of them died on the, when he got back to Lynn after two days. You know? And the other one, Westcott, lived though. You know? So you get people like this, and you, can, and you see these books like this, and it's the guys, it's the guys they're talking about it. You know? and, it's, and it, to me, it's just so real. Yeah. You know, in these books, in 1890, when they bought them, they bought four of them uh, for the, the, the business community, bought them for the, uh, for the people here. And it cost $600. Each book was worth $150. And if you look at it from an angle, you'll see it, it's all solid gold. You know, it, it, it's in the front of it, and the sides of it, it's all, it's, it really is beautiful. But $150 in 1890 was an awful lot of money for a book. But I guess the Lynn merchants also figured they were gonna get it back also because the, the, the whack that this place had, you know, uh, if, if they sent, if, if the GAR said something, you know, you went there and bought it, <laughs> you know? And uh, so they, they uh, they were very good about that. And the only other thing I want to say about these pictures down here, you know, forget, you know, forgetting about the Civil War for a minute, you know, you get 150 guys here that all died in Lynn, you know, and, and to me it's an amazing yeah. collection of people. And you know, they they would carry these things if you if you look at them, they all get the hats to the sides, you know, they all look like Jimmy Cagney, you know, it was cool and everything like that, and they were all dead within a year, you know, and. Uh, those of you that heard me give the little talk down here before, uh, my father, uh, 
I, I was a complete mistake. He was 52 years old when I was born, you know, so I was an era completely. But he was in World War One, and when I came down here, I saw his pictures over there, and uh, and I couldn't believe it myself when I came down here because the picture that we had in our house on Chestnut Street in Lynn, when the house burned down, and I we had lost that picture when I was like 12 years old. When I first came down here for the first meeting, I just I, I saw it over there. I, I went straight to his picture, you know, and. Uh, so it became fascinating, you know, and uh, so so all this stuff here, and uh, and you know, when you guys come through here, the, the, so many people come down to this meeting but never really go to the museum, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's so many things here, yeah. and I'm learning about them all from people like you, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. I remember Bob, 13 or 14 years ago, his first speech, he was a nervous wreck, now he sounds like Roosevelt giving the fireside <laughs> speech. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, really, you, you turned around completely. I'm still nervous. And there you go, thanks. Okay, thank you. When you look at that book over there, I have to say to you, don't touch. Yeah, use the gloves. Okay, don't touch. Uh, it's so important that, uh, and you've got to be very careful of the, the binding because it's very fragile and weak after a hundred and some years. It's tired, and uh, you're very fortunate that it's here tonight, because uh, usually we have it placed out of sight, out of mind, and just talk about it. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, when you, tonight you'll have an opportunity to look at it and maybe read what's on that front page. But please, do not touch. Uh, it's it's. Uh, Mr. Westcott that I talked about. Mr. Westcott. Because it is a fascinating thing if you want to read, he talks about escaping. Yeah. Over and over again. Yeah. So that's what we, just to give you an idea, that's just a touch of all of the information that this place is, has, and most people don't know it. It's really a crime. Okay. Uh, uh, no, I, mean, I, I saw Wendy already. She was already waving. Can someone talk on the issues between the pris about the prisoner exchanges between the North and the South and why it always wasn't fair and, and what the issues were? Do we have anybody that would like to try that? Okay, you can. Come ahead. Do you want to write? Right up here. Got to be here. I do not have a favorite Civil War uh, person, but I will speak about the issue of the prisoner exchange, which our, um, our housemaker, um, not P. Martin, had to deal with. It was pretty well known that the conditions in the southern um, prisons were far inferior to the northern, although the northern prisons did their fair share of damage to the prisoners. but. If there was going to be a fair exchange between the North and the South, the Northerners would get the bad end of the deal. Because if you got a Southern prisoner back from the Northern prisons, he would be in fighting shape. He would be ready to go back into battle. Whereas any Southern pris prisoner, and we've seen pictures and we've heard stories, would be in emaciated and in need of great amount of health care. So it was never equal, and that was one of the reasons why the North did not want a free one-to-one -one exchange of Northern and Southern prisoners. Okay, thank you. You Also, if you were a general, you uh, they one of the things that they did is, I, I don't know the exact number, but I know that if they were swapping a general. Uh, and, and they couldn't get another general in the swap, they would take and have 10 or 12 uh, regular soldiers uh, to well, make up. For any officer change. Yeah. Any, any officer that was going to be tra traded was, was valued at, you know, whether it was two soldiers or three or four, or like you say, for a general or a colonel, they might uh, bring in anywhere from eight to 10 okay. uh, for, that, yeah. for that officer. Yep, okay. When, when 
That's right. No, it was attributed to him, but it was actually Stanton who actually put, put his foot down to the But it was yeah. attributed to Grant because Grant is now in charge of everything. Okay. As you can see, we got a lot of knowledge here tonight. All right, Al, I think I saw you. Yeah, uh, favorite character? Your favorite character got to be Lincoln. Really? Okay. <laughs> I knew you would save the best for last. You're not last, but be quick. Uh, my favorite character of the Civil War is Abraham Lincoln. And the reason for it is uh, I've been a student of the Civil War since I was about 15 years old when I was in grammar school, so it's many decades ago. And one of the reasons why I, I, I switched to my, my desire to learn about Abraham Lincoln was in my little mind as a, as a, young, a youngster, I was unable to cope with all the statistics about battalions and regiments and corps, and, and I just couldn't keep track of all the, the people involved. So I switched over to Abraham Lincoln. And what I found all, over all these oh, some 60 some odd years of studying Lincoln is that how truly amazing he was. He was a man whose education was no better than a first grade education. His education was he could just barely read and write, but he learned the hard way by reading as many books as possible. And with that desire to learn, to overcome ignorance, he would be the author of some of the greatest documents our American history possesses. Can you imagine being the author of a, of a, of a speech entitled the Gettysburg Address? Now, one of the things about the Gettysburg Address that I learned over years and years ago when I was in grammar school was there were two things being in grammar school we were required to memorize. The first one, or maybe some of you might have remember, is called the Palmer Method of Handwriting, in which you had this free-flowing desire to shape all the letters in the alphabet when you wrote. And the other one, more importantly, I guess, because I think most of us have forgotten the Palmer Method of Writing, was the Gettysburg Address. And to this day, I still remember a good part of it on my own about reciting the Gettysburg Address. And the words just emanate beauty. Lincoln wrote the Gettysburg Address with the desire to have the audience remember when he wrote those few appropriate words. His desire was to have the, the audience remember those soldiers who lived and then died on the battlefield. And also that he was a strong constitutionalist. In other words, he was a firm believer in our Constitution. Then, not only did he, he, would he write the Gettysburg Address, but he would surpass himself by being the author of the Emancipation Proclamation. And then it would be the freedom of many, many of the slaves in the military states of the South. And then he would in, uh, uh, embellish even that by reciting his second inaugural speech and, and, and showing the people of, of the country that he w wished to have peace, tranquility, and a desire to have America again. And as I, as I read on and, and, to, and to realize all his writings made me a firm believer in that you can accomplish anything if you put your mind to it and you try hard. And he, without any exception, to me, is the greatest of all the 45 presidents. And there are some of the presidents who come close, but Abraham Lincoln far surpasses any of the 40, four, other 44 presidents, far surpasses. And that's why I, I enjoy thoroughly reading as much as I can about Abraham Lincoln. And I would like to see more and more people read about Abraham Lincoln. And knock wood, next week being February 12th, which is Abraham Lincoln's birthday, I have been asked by the Norwood Elks uh, Club, the senior set of down in Norwood Elks Club, to give a talk to commemorate Lincoln's birthday, which I, I love daily. And so when I go there on Tuesday to give my talk, my topic will be the Gettysburg Address. And I'm kind of hoping that some of them will re try to remember 
the, uh, that they memorized the Gettysburg Address. But I'm looking forward to it, and I continue to be a member of this roundtable, the Boston Roundtable, Sons of Union Veterans of the Civil War, the Lincoln Group of Boston, of which we're holding a meeting in another week or two. Bob is a fellow member that I've been a member for years. So of all the characters of the Civil War, my vote will always be Abraham Lincoln. Mr. Smith, did you, uh, this is the other Smith, by the way. Uh, are you, do you have anything you would like to add? But you no, got it? No, no, but I was going to say. Okay. I was going to say. Wait, there's a microphone. I would not automatically talk about Jeff Stewart or John Mosby, uh, because <laughs> I couldn't, I wouldn't call them my favorites. Yeah. Uh, because my favorites would still be the common soldier. Yes. Okay. Especially one of them from Waltham or, or the greater Boston area. Okay. Very good. Thank you. You're going to be that short. I'm, I, no, you gave him a minute. I, I yeah, I gave him a minute. Yeah, okay. Is there anybody else that has anything they'd like to add? Uh, not hearing anything. Wendy, do you want to talk anything about the Friends? Hello. <laughs> My name is Wendy Joseph. I am the president of the Friends of the Lynn GAR, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I would like to recognize Chris Bibby, our treasurer. Very important. And the whole reason we exist, the only reason we exist, is to raise funds to rehabilitate this GAR hall and contents, and to bring it up to not only be ADA compliant with complete climate control and elevator, et cetera, but to make it a 21st century museum. It will be, think PBD Essex, think interactive exhibits, think um, all of the stuff that is one page that's in file cabinet after file cabinet, documented um, things like uh, the picture with the Batchelder, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, big exhibits and, and uh, things that we have, they need to be restored. Um, money for all of that documentation and restoration. And we had all of the second meeting of the Friends just recently. And I'll, I'll give you a general update which includes um, some of the help that we are getting. Just for a background, in 2018, Chris helped us uh, apply for, um, through Lynn Spencer, an architect from Nahant, who's a Lynn girl, um, to be on the list of endangered properties from Preservation Mass. And we have the dubious distinction of being on the 10, um, on the list of 10 most endangered historical assets of 2018 is this hall. And with that comes um, certain, certain assistance from Preservation Mass and a lot of press. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been speaking to a girl named Jennifer Lefferts. Um, she writes for The Globe, uh, and um, that will be out coming up, and um, I'll be letting everyone know about that. In addition, um, as, as we were alluding to before, we have um, a lot of our ducks in a row getting ready to start this fundraising as soon as possible. Um, we have a proposed gift from a developer in Lynn. We have our state 501c3 nonprofit designation most importantly, right now, we are waiting for the federal designation, so that um, which, which is tied up in, in the backlog from the federal government shutdown. Once we get that, we can collect that first gift that was promised, and we can begin to uh, do all of the fundraising, which does include probably um, finding a professional fundraiser. We're talking eight to Eight to ten to twelve million dollars. This ain't no bake sale, people. Um, 
So as far as the Friends go, um, there were articles of incorporation um, that were uh, put into the Massachusetts um, uh, state website by one of the city solicitors who we were working with and um, one person who is on the friends board is um, a retired lawyer and he is going to make those much more um, nimble and clear so we're going to amend those articles of incorporation um, if anyone's been on boards they know that if you have too many specifics in your articles and bylaws it's going to it's going to bite you at some point in time um, so we're going to get more general so that we can do what we need to do. We're also going to be creating an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, between the Board of Trustees of the GAR and also the City of Lynn, so that um, even though we are merely a fundraising um, body, um, the Board of Trustees gets to decide where any money that we get goes, and it also then has to be confirmed by the Lynn City Council um, so that we don't have to go through uh, officialness every time we need to change a door hinge, et cetera. Um, we are going to enter into this memorandum so that we can have certain rights of, um, of progression and, and moving forward on, um, on the renovation. And part of this, uh, a great part of this renovation is going to be an updated assessment. Uh, an assessment done by architects includes the condition of the building, um, in addition to what you need to do, A, B, C, and D. You can't do D be before you do A, or else you're wasting your money. All that is done by the assessment. That assessment is at least 10 years old. And the people who did the previous assessment will update that assessment for us for the bargain price of $25,000. So that will be one of the first things that the fundraiser does. <clears throat> also, the Board of Trustees has not been reconstituted by the, um, the new mayor. Um, this is quite unusual, um, talking to people from the council and the solicitor's, solicitor's office, it's never taken this long to, um, to put people on boards. This board is very special in their, um, the things that they do, but also for the past couple, I would say five to 10 years, Dexter can make sure that I'm uh, correct or not. Um, the board hasn't been functioning too well because of uh, illness, or the actual uh, passing of some members. So there's a lot of board members that need to be put back on the board. At the last meeting, we were joined by Jeff Gonio, who is what they call the circuit rider from Preservation Mass. He's the person that gives us, um, that is assigned to us, gives us all the information that we can then pass on to the professional fundraiser. We were also joined by Joe Mulligan, who is a Mass TDI fellow, Transformative Development Initiative fellow. He recently got, if you've been reading the item, uh, the Brickyard, a lot of funding from Mass Development, and he kind of shepherded that through. He was here to give us the good news um, at the board meeting that the Architectural Resource Foundation of Massachusetts. They were the people that back in the day transformed Fennel Hall into what it is now. They have come up with a proposal that they're giving to mass development that will help with a number of things, including um, business plan, uh, various fundraising goals, etc., which is a number of things that we would be getting for free that we normally would be tasking the professional fundraiser to do. So that is very exciting news. Thank you. You're welcome. Great, so <laughs> Okay. I, uh, again, just want to look around the room. Anybody else got anything you would like to throw into the pot? Uh, before we 
go have a cup of coffee and a, and a donut? Seeing none. How about this? Yes. It seems to me, I've been coming here for 20 years, the more you learn about this place, which I learned from you guys, the more fresh it becomes. Yes, that's Magical right. Thing. It is actually such a resource, you really, uh, there, the, there were GAR ha halls all across the country. And most of them today are just shells, if they exist at all. We are so blessed here in Lynn to have what we have. Most of the uh, materials were collected and sent either to Philadelphia and then from Philadelphia over to Harrisburg, where it's just piled in a museum for keeping it safe. But we have here something that the common man, us guys, can actually sit down and read and see what is, you know, what did these guys think when they came back? What did they think when they were fighting? What a, a tremendous, tremendous resource we have here. It's unbelievable. If you could, I guess I get so excited because I, like Bob and a few others, I, I grew up here in Lynn and I had to be 20, what, 25, 30 years ago when I first really came in. I can remember coming here as a kid, but then forgetting about the place. But when I came down and became part of the, this round table, it just sort of grew on me. And today, I'm up to my uh, retirement uh, <laughs> doing all kinds of things to make sure that this hall will be here for the generations to come. It has to be, because if we lose this, we lose our own heritage, and we can't afford that. So thank you for coming tonight. I apologize for the fact that you had to put up with us instead of uh, Kevin Levin, but uh, he will return and bring his, his talk to us uh, at a later date. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.